two, one, roll. A third person infected with the coronavirus has been confirmed in the United States. The party of the decade in St. Louis. Very tense afternoon in Ferguson after a teenager is killed. The air full of uh, this tear gas. I'm gonna take him one day at a time. You, you feel the love? She is a survivor. Uh, we have some good news for you this evening. We did locate Ben this afternoon, and we've also located Sean Harnbeck. A bomber displayed like a jet goes immediately headed directly into the World Trade Center. It will be to the 30, 25, 20, and they will catch him today. So and we see the Holy Father. Making his arrival in St. Louis. Uh, that house is uh, starting to go. Oh, Jeff, it's unbelievable. There it goes. There was flames shooting up in the air 20, 30 feet high. Fort Igo is a mistake and we ought to recognize it as such. It's one small step for man. Martin Luther King was shot dead tonight. What is your reaction to that? It's a very pitiful and, and senseless killing. It's been a long time coming. Now the two legs going to meet. Yes, Chris. Uh... Michael, please. That uh, was to take the president to the hospital. Because I don't think there was a mon more wonderful man living than President Kennedy. It is terribly important to get these inoculations. Help us celebrate the 40th anniversary of Miss Plopper. I'm, I'm really glad that the schools have been integrated. Our story continues from St. Louis. This is John Rodell. I switch you now to David Brinkley, the NBC Newsroom. What's your two shot? Thanks for joining us as we celebrate five at 75. I'm Mike Bush and I'm Ann Allred. We've covered St. Louis news for more than seven decades. Everything from a bold move for equality to unexpected cargo found in the wreckage of a plane crash. Then there's the Missouri miracle, a holy hockey stick and an Illinois inmate locked up for a very long time. We're looking back at stories you may not remember and after the next hour, you'll never forget. Let's start at the beginning. The year was 1947. Missouri's own Harry Truman was president. World War II, a recent memory. America was in the middle of a post-war boom. St. Louis was one of the first cities in the country to introduce a fairly new invention called television. Grab your lunch and don't you hesitate. We're here to entertain you, so don't be late. Why? Education speaking this time from the uh, front of the Market Street entrance to beautiful Keel Municipal Auditorium. Your host can do the car. In the early days, it wasn't always about getting it right, it was about getting started. And that's what Channel 5 did back in February of 1947. Channel 5 was the first. You have to fine tune it, you know. Frank Absher is the founder of the Missouri Media History Foundation. Channel 5 joined a very small group of TV stations around the country. It all goes back to 12th and Olive in downtown St. Louis. And these two men, Joseph Pulitzer Jr. and the general manager of Pulitzer's KSD Radio, George Burbach. Television made a lot of sense for the Pulitzer Publishing Company. Its newspaper, the Post-Dispatch, had been in existence since 1878, and its radio station, KSD, had been on the air since 1922. They were ready to go before World War II. If the war had not broken out, television would have been gung-ho by 1943. And because of a freeze on new television station licenses imposed by the Federal Communications Commission, well, hello, KSD TV was the only television station in the St. Louis market for about five years. They used the Post Dispatch airplane to fly to the equipment manufacturer, load it up with the broadcast equipment, and get it back here to St. Louis so they could sign on. Back in 1981, Joseph Pulitzer Jr. remembered those early days. Uh, they would go out in the early days finding events that had movement and color, of, not, not, not color, but movement and, and interest. And that was a, a form of programming that uh, served to acquaint people with the medium of television. <laughs> Soon, KSD TV cameras were showing up at Cardinals baseball games and other big events. 
Was it radio personalities that were now moved to television and they're the ones who are the first people coming into St. Louis homes? Absolutely, because there were no television personalities. A man named Frank Eschen became a TV regular. He really did a lot of special events. He was news director and then he became director of special events. So anything special that popped up, he would do. If they had an open hour, they would roll the cameras out onto Olive or onto 12th Street and just have Frank talk to people walking by. That if you have a nice large platter to serve from. Another pioneer was Wilma Sim, who hosted a homemaker show. Wilma was a huge personality in St. Louis because she did cooking, she did those kinds of features, always had recipes, the recipes were printed in the Post-Dispatch. She had a huge following and was on the air probably for six or seven years. right now with the latest news headlines from the KSD TV newsroom. It took a few more years before local newscasts became part of the daily schedule. I think it was 1951 when they actually started a news broadcast, and I believe that John Rodell was the first person who did that. And early programmers didn't forget about the kids. The Wranglers Cartoon Club was the one that everyone remembers, and of course that was done by Texas Bruce. Be an eyewitness to the happenings that made history in the last 24 hours. In 1948, the big picture TV set from Magnavox cost about $280. Here's Artie Sheeler. Which would be more than $3,000 in today's money. So there weren't a lot of viewers. But a couple of years later, those costs went down and viewership went up. Uh, President Truman and Vice President Barkley. No one knew where this would all lead, but in St. Louis, when it comes to television, the future started yesterday, in 1947, right here on Channel 5. The future is so fascinating because it's totally unknown. You can plan and you can be totally wrong. Our city's iconic monument reached just halfway to the sky when their plan to protest played out. And while at lunch, everyone was relaxed, we walked right on up. They had a cylinder ladder and we just started climbing. Coming up, the story behind the arches link to civil rights. And it was the last thing anyone expected. The unforgettable moment captured by KSDK's camera. One of the first shows, 1950, I did a record show. The people just looked at a turntable and the record going around. Very mean, exciting. You Very mean exciting. people actually watch that kind of program? Well, they watch the turntable and they watch test patterns and uh, they like to watch themselves. And I think this will probably be the hottest summit in civil rights that we've ever had. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. made that comment on a visit to St. Louis just four months before President Lyndon Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The movement did heat up that summer, especially along the riverfront, where a landmark was being built. Kelly Jackson revisits a monumental climb for equality and a reunion nearly 58 years in the making. Perhaps you've heard the story of how activists Percy Green and Richard Daly climbed a section of the Gateway Arch while it was under construction on July 14, 1964. It was a bold move. The reason was simple. Hire black construction workers to build the arch. What you haven't heard is their story of what happened that day told together until now. And we were there. How yeah. you doing? I'm doing okay. How yeah. you doing? Oh, about as good as to be expected. Good oh, man. My man, long time no yes, see. Yes, it's you know. been a long it's time. It's been a long time. Both men now in their 80s are moving a little slower than their arch climbing days, catching up on surprising revelations. You spend time down at the workhouse. Yeah. Six days. Uh huh. In the back, uh -huh. I was in uh, segregation because they thought I was a troublemaker. Oh. <laughs> the mission to climb 125 feet up the arch was a well thought out plan that started with a visit to the site prior to the actual climb. We walked up and, and, and did this number, and the, the, uh, the uh, workers were sitting around eating. They reported back to their group and put the plan into action. Other members would be the decoy protesting at the old courthouse. He just went for it, right? And we just walked right up, and then we started climbing. They climbed about 125 feet. The thinking was that we wanted to be a safe distance from the workers. The work they, they were working at the 300-foot barn. Their brave act of civil disobedience that day was simple and clear. Hire blacks to work construction. We felt as if that black folks had the ability to learn 
just needed the opportunity. While you're up there, did anyone at any point try to get you to come down? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes, I did. And the, the cops came up there and said, you have to get down. You have to get down now. And we said, well, no, we don't. Just over five hours later, they did come down. Both were eventually loaded into a police van, refusing to walk. The first arrest for both men. I'm not going to walk to jail. Their climb for equality would have swift ramifications for Mr. Green. August the 28th of that year, I was terminated uh, from, uh, from my job after having eight years of seniority. He qualified for another job at McDonnell Douglas, but he didn't get it. So Mr. Green filed a lawsuit after the 1964 Civil Rights Act was passed. It went all the way to the Supreme Court, and he won. My case made it possible to prove racial discrimination uh, in employment circumstantially. Green's participation and firing, in essence, led to two major civil rights decisions with long-lasting effects. Daily situation was different. It was very close to going back to graduate school. That's kind of the reason why I figured I'd just go to jail. Did it feel like you were, wow, the outcome of this could really enact change? I was very naive. I thought, we're, we're going to fix this problem. I really had no idea how deep and difficult the problem was. Yeah, there's a ladder. Yeah. Their move did enact change. Two years later, in 1966, the National Park Service hired an African-American plumbing firm to work on the Arch Visitor Center. Their actions also changed federal hiring practices in our country. History. Yeah. This is. This is. Ironically, neither men have been up in the Arch. There's a ladder right here someplace. But being next to it, feeling it, and knowing their role was in this grand monument is what matters to them. Ozark Airlines Flight 809 never arrived at its destination, crashing just a few miles shy of the runway. I myself only saw two survivors. Almost 50 years later, how memories of that ill-fated flight shaped one man's life. It's unbelievable, there it goes. It was video that went viral before there was such a thing. The clip seen around the world that defined the flood of 93. Again, you've got a lot of uh, major companion projects down here on the front. Do you ever take a moment out and see how they're coming with their job? Well, I've been watching the uh, popular street bridge crossing a good deal of interest. The stadium uh, looks like they're moving right along. I uh, hope to see some ball games there next summer. And too, there's the uh, Mansion House project, uh, Ken. That seems to be coming along, at least uh, from this bird's eye view, anyway. Well, I think they get uh, about a floor a week. In St. Louis, government investigators today began looking into last night's crash of an Ozark airline. It was the worst plane crash in St. Louis history. On July 23rd, 1973, Ozark Airlines Flight 809 was less than three miles from Lambert Airport when it disappeared from the radar. Justina Cornell takes us back to that terrible day. When he did go overhead, he seemed to be wobbling his wings back and forth. A few lightning bolts that came real close. Uh, one of them looked as if it could have been hitting the wing. Well, there was flames shooting up in the air 20, 30 feet high. They determined it as being an unsurvivable crash. And yet some people did. That's correct, they did, but how they did, I say it's, it's a miracle. I myself only saw two survivors. Uh, one was uh, Stuart Zykvitz, he was the 30-year-old man. We pulled him out from under some wreckage. Just closed my eyes and said, well, nothing I can do about it, and if it's my time, it's my time. Then I thought, you know, this is a good time to, for me to do my meditation. So I closed my eyes and started meditating. In the blink of an eye, Stuart Sykes' life changed. Then all of a sudden, my my sense of touch came back. I started feeling with my, with my hands, and I remember saying to myself, oh my God, we crashed. Sykes was with 43 others on the Ozark Airlines Flight 809 in the summer of 1973, when a deadly storm flipped their lives upside down. He's one of six survivors, including the pilot and co-pilot. It was a beautiful day. It was uh, sunny, 
uh, you know, July day. Sykes recalls being one of the first to board the plane and felt moved to a certain seat. All of a sudden I felt this kind of a strange sensation. It was like, kind of like, I always have described it as like warm pillows on my shoulders that pushed me to the left. He wanted to switch seats, but a hasty crowd made him stay put. Then the plane took off. We're bouncing around. The weather soon transformed into a severe storm. And as quickly as wheels went up, the plane came down. It crashed and scattered on a wooded hillside in a ravine, not more than 200 feet from an occupied Umsel's field house and three miles short from Lambert Airport. Everybody around me died. Sykes was in the midst of destruction, dead bodies, and debris. Still in the sea he never chose, but in a spot that kept him alive. I remember calling out over here. I was still strapped in my seat, but the plane had cracked in half, and the nose of the plane looked like came back touching the tail, laying next to the tail, and I was sitting there still in my seat, but the whole fuselage around me was open. There was no more airplane there. As neighbors assisted him, first responders scoured through the wreckage, piece by piece, trying to find more survivors and those who didn't make it. Sykes broke his back when the plane went down, but he's a survivor. Despite the trauma, he's rebuilt his life step by step. His life now, a stark contrast of that terrible day, something that Sykes and his wife have grown from the ground up. While he doesn't fear crashing again, he does worry. Why haven't I flown? Because of COVID. I think flying is uh, extremely uh, risky and dangerous for the uh, transmission uh, of the virus. For now, he's taking things day by day. As for the 38 who perished, Sykes wishes they too could have seen another day. I always felt sorry uh, f for them. I would have much preferred if we all had lived. To keep their memories alive, St. Louis author Bryce York is leading the efforts to build a memorial here near Ground Zero. Now, COVID delayed those plans, but she hopes to make it happen for the 50th anniversary next year. I'm Kay Quinn. An interesting side note, first responders thought they found all of the victims and survivors the night of that plane crash. Well, they were wrong. Two days later, our cameras were rolling when something unexpected happened. There's a live dog in there. A live dog? Yeah, we just found it. Found by a fireman who reached into the wreckage to retrieve an axe. Put my hand down, felt something soft and it moved on me. Kind of scared me. <laughs> and I looked again, it was a big old dog. He was actually a she that was being shipped back to a breeder. And he must have been, been in her all this time. Not crying a bit. The beagle had an eye injury, but was otherwise okay. She was turned over to the Humane Society and eventually adopted by someone in St. Louis County. Her new owners named her Lady Jane. She's the inspiration behind author Bryce A. York's historical fiction novel, The Fate of Lady Jane. Her symbolism is so important because it's about the uncertainty of life. I mean, 38 human beings were taken and yet this doggy, darling little puppy, a beagle, survives. There's never a dull moment when it comes to St. Louis weather. Some of it's fun and some destruction at its worst. We're digging through archives to share some unforgettable moments. Uh, that house is uh, starting to go. Oh, Jeff, it's up. How about that? And talk about memories. Thousands packed downtown streets to welcome the Stanley Cup. It's just one of our top stories in sports. St. Louis weather can put on a show. Through the years, our photographers have captured Mother Nature at its best and its worst. Tonight, we're counting down the top five weather videos from our archives. First up at number five, the big snowstorm of 73. A lot has changed in 50 years, but apparently not how St. Louisans drive in the snow. Stay home if you don't know how to drive on this type of a street. 12 inches of snow shut down the city and overwhelmed operators. Would it uh, come close, would you say, from your years of experience at the job at uh, setting a record for this particular type of... I would think so, yes, sir. Right. Okay. Several hundred, I know. The snow stranded people on the roads. Well, they're stuck, you know, on a highway or can't get started. And grounded those at the airports. How long have you been here? Over last night. 
Oh, last night. I slept here last night. Right here in the airport, huh? Right here in the airport, yeah. Number four is a unique one. One of our crews learned how hard the elements can be, and it all went down over the Mississippi River. The engine over revved, and we immediately came down towards the water, uh, which I had no control. We were downward descent. Did you have any trouble getting out? No, we just kicked the door, and uh, uh, I had made it just one decision to throw my camera away. <laughs> and, uh, this one isn't from one weather event, but many. We can't talk about our weather archives without showing off Art Hill on a good snow day. That's why our favorite sledding hill takes the spot at number three. We cannot talk about wild weather without talking about the flood of 93. It left its mark here on the by state. Even here at the Gateway Arch National Park, this plaque marks the highest point of the flood, 49.58 feet for the Mississippi. I think you have to wonder whether the house is going to be able, the home is going to be able to withstand the force of the water. Uh, that house is uh, starting to go. Oh, Jeff, it's unbelievable. There it goes. Just now lifted off the foundation and it's just crumbling in the rapid and the violent waters here. The Great Flood of 93 is one of the most costly and devastating floods in modern history. Some towns along the Mississippi were underwater for 200 days. Spots along the Missouri River spent close to 100 days flooded. Often our most difficult and most dangerous weather to cover is tornadoes. In 1959, one took out the roof of the St. Louis Arena. In 67, homes in Maryland Heights. The Good Friday 2011 tornado Lambert Airport got hit. So did multiple neighborhoods in its 21 mile path. Fall of 2013, during an outbreak of tornadoes, one tore through New Minden, Illinois. And 2021, Edwardsville's EF3 tornado. No matter the weather, We'll be here to cover it. We've covered some of the greatest moments in sports, from Stan the Man to Olympic legends, from Super Bowl MVPs to Stanley Cup champions. 75 years of highlights headed your way. Play hockey. It was a simple hockey stick handed to the Holy Father. Find out what's happened to the gift given to a future saint. Jean's voice talking about the farmhouse. That w her voice was heard all over the world. Here we go. Here goes a part of the shed. On our honeymoon, we went to Jamaica, and we're sitting at a table over from a, a young English couple, and they asked what we did, and we you know, told them we worked in St. Louis, and they went, the white farmhouse. The white farmhouse. That was you. I thought it was kind of maybe going to be just not real, like, okay, I'm going to pretend. And no, it was serious. I mean, the man did, literally had his hand on my hand in case I froze because they were on a time, they were on a clock, they were, I mean, they were, and he goes, I'm going to just do this in case. And I, I thought, really, this thing here is really going to click it all off? And he's like, yeah, and I went, wow. I'm sports director Frank Cusimano. When you look at the past 75 years of sports in St. Louis, the memories come generally in two categories, heroes and achievements. Of course, Mark McGuire covered both. And Channel 5 viewers have seen a kaleidoscope of stars. Stan Musio was already the man when we hit the air. But in the years to come, our cameras captured Stan achieving 3,000 hits saying goodbye to the game, captured in bronze, reaching the Hall of Fame, beloved in our hearts. <laughs> the St. Louis Hawks came to town in 1955, bringing Bob Pettit with them. Big Blue led the Hawks to a championship three years later. In 1960, St. Louis became a three-sport town when the football Cardinals moved from Chicago. John, how do you feel about being selected the National Football League's Rookie of the Year? One of their stars, Sonny Randall, became Channel 5's sports director for several years. In 1967, St. Louis got the Blues, and hockey became a hot ticket, playing for the Stanley Cup three years in a row. 
Baseball was still king with the Cardinals winning the World Series twice in the 1960s, led by the Hall of Famers, Lou Brock and Bob Gibson. No dabs, no pretty lips. I'm pretty fighting like Sugar Ray. I be dancing and singing. Boxing great Muhammad Ali was a regular visitor to our town. And the world's greatest soccer player, Pele, made two appearances here. In the 1970s, the spirits of St. Louis flashed onto the scene after the Hawks left town. With the mercurial Marvin Barnes as the headliner, the myths they generated became far greater than any crowds they drew. Gary Unger became the face of the blues, a face surrounded by flowing blonde hair. Don Coryell, Jim Hart, and the Big Red hit their peak then. The Cardiac Cards won 31 games in three seasons. Indoor soccer became the rage as the 80s began. The steamers packed the arena, becoming one of the biggest draws for indoor sports in North America. Conversely, Hall of Famer Bernie Federko and the Blues fell on hard times. They were within a whisker of leaving for Saskatoon. But they rallied, much like they did in pulling off the Monday Night Miracle. Jackie Joyner Kersey and her brother Al brought Olympic gold to East St. Louis. JJK dominated in the long jump and the heptathlon for more than a decade. The 80s, though, was the decade for Whitey Ball. He's coming to the plate, he steals home, and the ball game is over. Where everyone stole bases, even third string catchers. Two pennants and a World Series title, and everyone knew about Willie, Vince, and a wizard who turned the infield at Bush Stadium into the land of Oz. Got him! Oh, what a player! The Blues had the golden Brett. And Wayne Brett And briefly, the great one. Hall of Famer Al McKinnis was a star here, and Chris Pronger became a league MVP. Still no Stanley Cups. The Big Red moved out in the 80s, but the Rams came in the 90s. Running back Marshall Falk and quarterback Kurt Warner won MVPs. And it was our town's Mike Jones who preserved our only Super Bowl. Cracks away and fires. Big Mac. Swing! And it's shot into the corner. It might make it. There it is. Mark McGuire made St. Louis baseball's home run capital. And he was followed by a phenom named Pujols. The Cardinals won the World Series in 2006, and then again in 2011, thanks to David Fries living out the ultimate story of a local boy makes good. I'm so damn proud to be part of this team right now. It took until 2019, but the Blues finally brought home the Stanley Cup. I'm a hometown hero, baby! Pat Maroon and the Blues made every St. Louis hockey fan's dream come true. That long-awaited parade down Market Street with the Stanley Cup. 75 years of stars with many more to come. Most of us know exactly where we were when we heard the news. We did locate Ben this afternoon uh, in the city of Kirkwood, and we've also located Sean Harnbeck. It was a homecoming few expected, and they called it the Missouri Miracle. Convicted and almost forgotten. After more than six decades in prison, this man was finally set free. The one thing he just couldn't believe about the modern world. Did you ever imagine 50 years ago that it would, the Clydesdales would become the institution that they've become? I did not realize it, but I thank God they did. Pope John Paul II may not have had the biggest crowd, so we kept on telling people there's going to be gridlock, don't come down. If you come down, take public transportation, try to carpool. And it was cold that night, so that might have kept some people away. But a lot of people, I think, were scared. So he came barreling down Pine Street, doing about 40, 45 miles an hour, turned on Tucker, then turned right on Market, didn't even slow down, didn't wave, didn't do anything because he was running late for the mass for the youth. When you think of memorable moments for the Blues franchise and enterprise, you may think of the Brett Hull retirement or the Pat Maroon goal, but January 26, 1999 is right there with those moments. With the help of photographer Randy Schwenker, 
we give you the story. They just about over, but get a shoot, he scores! Oh, baby! They were a hockey team loaded with world-class future Hall of Famers. He was Pope John Paul II, one of the most influential men in the world, and also a sports fan? He was an avid sportsman himself. He, when he was a young person, he played soccer, he was a skier, and then he played some hockey as a young man. And on his fourth trip to the United States, St. Louis wanted to give this ex-hockey player a stick. This stick, which is now a religious relic because the Pope became a saint in 2014, can only be handled with gloves. If it wasn't a relic, if it was just an artifact, since it's wood, the oils in my hand wouldn't bother it as much, so I wouldn't really have to wear, wear gloves to handle it. But now that it is a relic and it does have uh, a little bit more of a religious status to it, I take a little bit extra care with it. This religious relic is not just a hockey stick, it's a hockey stick signed by the St. Louis Blues. It was a good time to be a St. Louis Blues. Jamie Rivers, now a Blues broadcaster, was a defenseman on that squad. Rivers, a shot, he scores! He remembers signing that stick. And sometimes there's rows of sticks and you sign away. Well, this one here, they were like, hey, take your time and sign this because, you know, we're presenting it to the Pope. The Pope was given the stick, and then he swung it. Imagine the Pope coming to the building where you play and receiving a stick you signed. Now to find out that you know the Pope actually received a hockey stick signed by our team and that my signature is on there, it's a pretty amazing moment. And this religious relic, which rests at Cardinal Regali Center, won't be seen very often in the near future. They want to preserve it for 500 years and beyond. We only get it out in, in specific instances. The Pope, the stick, and the blues. Never thought those three words would be used in the same sentence. One of the most astounding stories is when two missing Missouri boys were found in the apartment of their kidnapper, Michael Devlin. Devlin held one of those boys for years. Sean Hornbeck and Ben Ownby were found alive 15 years ago on January 12, 2007. Their story of survival forever known as the Missouri Miracle. I want you guys to go up this road. 20 years ago, the search for 11-year-old Sean Hornbeck started. A child was missing, and the town of Richwoods, Missouri, responded immediately. All through that night, that first night, out in the woods all around, and just people everywhere yelling Sean's name over and over. It was October 2002. Sean was out riding his bike and never came home. Ground zero for the search was here, the Book of Acts Church, where Rhonda Smith was a parishioner. Now, she's a pastor. Search volunteers reported here to be split up in teams. The congregation fed them and held constant prayer vigils for Sean's safe return. No matter how long, it will, we will not stop. I don't care how long it takes. <sighs> but days turned into weeks, and nothing turned up. It's probably got to be the worst feeling that anybody could ever feel. Four and a half years would go by, and then it happened again. This time in Beaufort, a town in Franklin County, Missouri. It was January 2007. 13-year-old Ben Ownby was kidnapped from his rural bus stop and never showed up for school. I called the uh, principal of, at the high school, and I told him, I said, you know, could Ben have been, uh, could he have missed the bus, still be home? And he said, no, he said, Ben is a good kid. And he said, if he's not there, he said, something's wrong. The search started for Ben, and investigators had one lead a white truck speeding away from the bus stop. Ben's observant teenage neighbor was able to describe it in amazing detail. Four days later, the truck was spotted at this apartment complex in Kirkwood. Within hours, then Franklin County Sheriff Gary Tolke broke the astounding news. We did locate Ben this afternoon uh, in the city of Kirkwood, and we've also located Sean Harnbeck. Both boys found safe and alive. It just seemed like the whole world just came alive around us. Everybody was so excited. The boys were taken to the Franklin County Sheriff's Office to be reunited with their parents. Tolkey watched Sean see his parents for the first time in more than four years. With Sean, uh, you know, it was kind of quiet at first because I think nobody knew how to react. The boys' kidnapper and abuser, Michael Devlin, was a pizza restaurant manager in Kirkwood. In the months that followed, he was convicted in court. 
But it's what Devlin said on the way to court one day that Tolkien will never forget. He was in the back of the SWAT van with some of my team members, and he mentioned to one of them, he said, I know what I've done. Uh, he, he said, if I get out, I'll do it again. Getting out is not an option. Devlin is serving 74 life sentences. Ben and Sean got their lives back. Their strength and survival forever known as the Missouri Miracle. Sentenced to a life behind bars, he never dreamed he'd be a free man. Yes, I'm ready for something. I want to do something. I'm not going to lay around. The unexpected turn of events that gave him a second chance at life. and that's I get out early in the mornings, I don't get a chance to read, and television has offered me uh, a great uh, avenue for uh, knowledge. Do you think it's improving? Yes, I do. I think the quality is much better. We've introduced you to so many memorable people over the years, but chances are you've never heard of Richard Honick. Michelle Lee takes us back to the early 1960s for the story of a man who time forgot. Uh, Mr. Hornick, are you uh, uh, going to leave some friends behind here at Menard? Yes, there are very many acquaintances, and uh, they know me. Many of them, they know me better than I do of my own self. On December 20th, 1963, Richard Honick walked out of Menard State Prison and into a new mid-century modern world. It surprised me very much how things are looking. This is all new. Honick was 20 years old when he was sentenced to life in prison for murder. The year was 1899, the Victorian era. There were no airplanes, radio, or television. Horses outnumbered cars, which were called horseless carriages. Before his release, Honick had only ridden in a car once, 1930. His second car ride was much more enjoyable. It was so nicely built, and he's so up to date. It surprised me. They, they ride just exactly what it might say, a cradle. <laughs> How did you they do not run, they glide. Honick was first eligible for parole in 1949. With no family members to claim him, he'd linger another 14 years behind bars. Then in 1963, Honick's niece read an article about her uncle and traveled to Illinois, securing his release. A lot had changed during the six decades he spent in prison. Yes, I notice how the people are dressed. Uh -huh. Yes, I've been noticing that for years. Uh -huh. But and you see it in magazines and newspapers, don't you? Oh, yes, yes, uh -huh. I saw that, the advertisement of what got they offer for sale. And I see uh, people making use of it. The architecture. And you see where all these houses are built? Uh -huh. That's entirely different to what it used to be. The day after he walked out of Menard, Honick flew to San Francisco to live with his niece. How do you feel about flying out to California now? Well, I'm ready for that, too. You ready for planes? Yeah. You're not afraid of them? Oh, no, not at all. Quite an adventure when you consider he was sent to prison four years before the Wright brothers' first flight. Do you have any plans, anything you'd like to do in particular after you get out to California? Yes, I'm ready for something. I want to do something. I'm not going to lay around. Honick lived another 13 years. He died in 1976 at age 97. Honick did not have a single visitor for 59 of the 64 years he was in prison. He used the time to turn his life around, becoming a model prisoner. Now, Honick sliced bread in the prison's kitchen for years. And get this, a reporter once asked him what amazed him the most about his newfound freedom. He said supermarkets and the rows and rows of sliced bread. And there you have it, a snapshot of KSDK's first 75 years. You can find all kinds of history and archival footage on KSDK.com slash 75. And as we look to our future and our next 75 years, we leave you with more special memories from the past. Thank you for joining us. Well, we got away with it again.
I used to have a saying at the end of my newscast, I hope you've had a pleasant day today, and we'll have an even better day tomorrow. Bob Jay's reporting. Good night.